part of yours. Thanks. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Katie Weaver and Brian Lynn. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky asked members of the United States Congress Wednesday to do more to help his country against the Russian invasion. Wearing a military green t-shirt, he said, We need you right now. The Ukrainian president delivered the speech to Congress over a video link. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi introduced him with a cheer in Ukrainian, Glory to Ukraine. American lawmakers stood up for a time to cheer Zelensky at the start and at the end of his speech. Zelensky said, Remember Pearl Harbor, the terrible morning of December 7, 1941, when your sky was black from the planes attacking you. Just remember it. Remember September 11th, a terrible day in 2001 when evil tried to turn your city's independent territories into battlefields. He also used the words of Martin Luther King Jr., saying, I have a dream. These words are known to each of you today, I can say. I have a need, a need to protect our sky. Russia has turned the Ukrainian sky into a source of death for thousands of people, Zelensky said. And he showed a video with images of death and destruction that ended with the words, Close the sky over Ukraine. The Ukrainian president continued his appeal for what he describes as a humanitarian no-fly zone. But he offered an alternative, calling for air defense missile systems like the S-300. He also appealed for more warplanes and stronger economic measures against Russia. Zelensky ended his speech with a direct appeal to American President Joe Biden. He spoke in English, You are the leader of the nation, of your great nation. I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. Zelensky's speech to the U.S. Congress followed similar appeals for help before the parliaments of Europe Britain, and Canada. Nearly two weeks ago, he also met over video with some U.S. lawmakers. At the time, he also asked for a no-fly zone, a term for closing the airspace over a country and for more aircraft. Speaking from the White House, Biden said Zelensky speaks for a people who have shown remarkable courage and strength in the face of brutal aggression. Courage and strength that's inspired not only Ukrainians, but the entire world. Architect Dibedo Francis Carré of Burkina Faso has won the Pritzker Prize, the world's highest recognition in building design. The 56-year-old Carré was honored Tuesday for his pioneering designs, said Tom Pritzker. He is chairman of the Hyatt Foundation 
which awards the prize. The architect's works, he continued, are sustainable to the earth and its inhabitants in lands of extreme scarcity. Carré is a citizen of both Burkina Faso and Germany and lives in Berlin. On Tuesday, he said he was the happiest man on this planet to become the 51st recipient of the famous yearly prize. Carré is famed for building schools, health centers, housing, and other public spaces across Africa. His buildings can be found in his homeland, as well as in Benin, Mali, Kenya, Mozambique, Togo, and Sudan. He is equally architect and servant, improving upon the lives and experiences of countless citizens in a region of the world that is at times forgotten, Pritzker said. Carré won special praise for his 2001 project to build a primary school in Gando, the village where he was born. Unlike traditional school buildings which use concrete, Carré's inventive design combined local clay and cement to form bricks. The material helps keep the building cool in a hot environment. A wide raised metal roof protects the building from rain and helps airflow. Carré involved the local community throughout the design and building of the school. The number of students at the school increased from 120 to 700, the Hyatt Foundation said in its release. The success of the project saw the creation of an extension, a library and teacher's housing in later years. Carré empowers communities through the process of architecture, the Pritzker statement added. It praised Carré additionally for loyalty to social justice and community empowerment. Carré is the first African to be honored with the Pritzker. In his native Burkina Faso, citizens celebrated the win. In the current pain of the security crisis, our country must remember that it is also the nation of exceptional men, like Francis Carré, said Rasabga Seydou Udraugo of the nonprofit Free Afrique. Nebila Aristide Bazi, head of the Burkina Faso's Architects Council, said the award highlights the African architect and the people of Burkina Faso. In 2017, Carré designed the Serpentine Pavilion in London's Hyde Park. The highly sought contract is given to a world-famous architect every year. He was also one of the architects behind Geneva's International Museum of the Red Cross and Red Crescent. I'm Katie Weaver. Researchers have developed an artificial intelligence system to help fill in missing words in ancient writings. The system is designed to help historians restore the writings and identify when and where they were written. Many ancient populations used writings also known as inscriptions, to document different parts of their lives. The inscriptions have been found on materials such as rock, ceramic, and metal. The writings often contained valuable information 
about how ancient people lived and how they structured their societies. But in many cases, the objects containing such inscriptions have been damaged over the centuries. This left major parts of the inscriptions missing and difficult to identify and understand. In addition, many of the inscribed objects were moved from areas where they were first created. This makes it difficult for scientists to discover when and where the writings were made. The new AI-based method serves as a technological tool to help researchers repair missing inscriptions and estimate the true origins of the records. The researchers, led by Alphabet's AI company DeepMind, call their tool Ithaca. In a statement, the researchers said the system is the first deep neural network that can restore the missing text of damaged inscriptions. A neural network is a machine learning computer system built to act like the human brain. The findings were recently reported in a study in the publication Nature. Researchers from other organizations, including the University of Oxford, Kafaskori University of Venice, and Athens University of Economics and Business, also took part in the study. The team said it trained Ithaca on the largest collection of data containing Greek inscriptions from the nonprofit Packard Humanities Institute in California. Feeding this data into the system is designed to help the tool use past writings to predict missing letters and words in damaged inscriptions. The researchers reported that in experiments with damaged writings, Ithaca was able to correctly predict missing inscription elements 62% of the time. In addition, the tool was 71% correct in identifying where the inscriptions first came from and the system was able to effectively date writings to within 30 years, the team said. Yanis Asail is a research scientist with deep mind who helped lead the study. He said in a statement that Ithaca was designed to support historians to expand and deepen our understanding of ancient history. When historians work on their own, the success rate for restoring damaged inscriptions is about 25%. But when humans teamed up with Ithaca to assist in their work, the success rate jumped to 72%, Asail said. Thea Summershield was another lead researcher on the project. She is the Marie Curie Fellow at Kafaskari University of Venice. Summershield said she hopes systems like Ithaca can unlock the cooperative potential between AI and humans in future restoration work involving important ancient inscriptions. She said the system had already provided new information to help researchers re-examine important periods in Greek history. In one case, Ithaca confirmed new evidence presented by historians about the dating of a series of important Greek decrees. The decrees were first thought to have been written before 446-445 BCE, 
but the new evidence suggested a date in the 420s BCE. Ithaca predicted a date of 421 BCE. Summershield said that the date change may seem small, but it has significant implications for our understanding of the political history of classical Athens, she added. The team is currently working on other versions of Ithaca trained on other ancient languages. DeepMind has launched a free interactive tool based on the system for use by researchers, educators, museum workers, and the public. I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. History is full of examples of leaders joining together to meet common goals. But rarely have two leaders worked together with as much friendship and cooperation as Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill did. Roosevelt was President of the United States. Churchill was Prime Minister of Britain. The two men had much in common. They were both born to wealthy families, and they were both active in politics for many years. Both leaders also shared a love of history and nature and the sea. Roosevelt and Churchill first met when they were lower-level officials during World War I, but neither man remembered much about that meeting. However, as they worked together during the Second World War, they came to like and trust each other. Roosevelt and Churchill exchanged more than 1,700 letters and messages over a period of five and a half years. They met many times at large international gatherings and in private talks. But the closeness of their friendship might be seen best in a story told by one of Roosevelt's close advisors, Harry Hopkins. Hopkins remembered how Churchill was visiting Roosevelt at the White House one day. Roosevelt went into Churchill's room in the morning to say hello, but the president was shocked to see Churchill coming from the bathroom with no clothes on. Roosevelt immediately apologized to the British leader, but Churchill reportedly answered, the Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. The United States and Great Britain were the most powerful of the nations that joined together as allies to resist Germany's Adolf Hitler and his Axis partners. In January of 1942, 26 of the Allied nations signed an agreement promising to fight for the goals of peace, religious freedom, human rights, and justice. The three major allies were the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union. The governments in Washington and London did not always agree. For example, they disagreed about when to attack Hitler's forces in Western Europe. And Churchill resisted Roosevelt's suggestions that Britain give up some of its colonies. But in general, the friendship between Roosevelt and Churchill and between the United States and Britain led the two nations to cooperate closely. This was not true with the Soviets. The Soviet Union was a communist country. It did not share the same history or political system as the United States or Britain. And the Soviet Union had its own interests to protect along its borders and in other areas. (music) 
Relations between the Soviet Union and the Western Allies were mixed. On the one hand, Hitler's invasion deep into the Soviet Union had forced Joseph Stalin and other Soviet leaders to make victory over the Germans their most important goal. On the other hand, shadows of future problems could already be seen. The Soviet Union was making clear its desire to keep political control over Poland, and it was supporting communist fighters in Yugoslavia and Greece. These differences were not discussed much as the foreign ministers of Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States gathered in Moscow in 1943. Instead, they reached several agreements, including on a plan to establish a new organization called the United Nations. Finally, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin met together for the first time. They met in Tehran in late 1943, mainly to discuss the military situation. However, the three leaders also considered political questions, such as the future of Germany, Eastern Europe, and East Asia. Later, the Allies made further plans for the new United Nations. They arranged for new international economic organizations, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And the Allies agreed to divide Germany into different parts after the war for a temporary period. The Soviet Union would occupy the eastern part, while Britain, France, and the United States would occupy the west. Washington, London, and Moscow were united during the early years of the war because of military need. They knew they must fight together to defeat their common enemy. But this unity faded as Allied troops marched toward the German border. Roosevelt continued to call on the world to wait until the last bullet was fired before deciding what would come next. But Churchill, Stalin, and other leaders already were trying to shape the world that would follow the war. Now differences between the Allies became more serious. The most important question was Poland. Hitler's invasion of Poland in 1939 had started the war. Roosevelt and Churchill believed strongly that the Polish people should have the right to choose their own leaders after the war. Churchill supported a group of Polish resistance leaders who had an office in London. In 1940, Polish flyers had taken part in the Battle of Britain, piloting British warplanes against the German Luftwaffe. But Stalin had other ideas. He demanded that Poland's border be changed to give more land to the Soviet Union. And he refused to help the Polish resistance leaders in London. Instead, he supported a group of Polish communists and help them establish a new government in Poland. Churchill visited Stalin late in 1944. The two leaders met with Roosevelt a few months later in Yalta on the Crimean coast. All agreed that free elections should be held quickly in Poland. And they traded ideas about the future of Eastern Europe, China, and other areas of the world. Roosevelt was in good spirits when he reported to Congress after his return from the Yalta Conference. I come from the Crimea Conference with a firm belief that we have made a good start on the road to a world of peace. There were two main purposes in this Crimea Conference. The first was to bring the peace of Germany 
the greatest possible speed and the smallest possible loss of allied men. That purpose is now being carried out in great force. The German army and the German people are feeling the ever-increasing might of our fighting men and of the allied armies, and every hour gives us added pride in the heroic advance of our troops in Germany on German soil toward a meeting with the gallant Red Army. The second purpose was to continue to build the foundation for an international accord that would bring order and security after the chaos of the war, that would give some assurance of lasting peace among the nations of the world. That goal, too, in that goal, toward that goal, a tremendous stride was made. Roosevelt went on to say that the peace cannot be a completely perfect system at first, but it can be a peace based on the idea of freedom. Churchill had the same high hopes. He told the British Parliament after the conference that Stalin and other Soviet leaders wished to live in honorable friendship. I also know that their word is honest, Churchill said. But as history proved, Roosevelt and Churchill were wrong about the Soviets. In the months after the Yalta Conference, relations between Moscow and the Western democracies grew steadily worse. The Soviet Union moved to seize control of Eastern Europe. Stalin began making strong speeches, charging that Washington and London were holding secret peace negotiations with Germany and the Soviet Union refused to discuss ways to bring democracy to Poland. <music> Churchill wrote later that he had always held the Russian people in high honor, but their shadow darkened the picture after the war. Britain and America had gone to war not just to defend the smaller countries, but also to fight for individual rights and freedoms. Churchill went on to say that the Soviet Union had other goals. Its hold tightened on Eastern Europe after the Soviet army gained control. And Churchill said that after the long suffering and efforts of World War II, it seemed that half of Europe had just exchanged one dictator for another. Churchill and Roosevelt agreed in secret letters that they must try to oppose the Soviet effort. But before they could act, Roosevelt died. And the world began to live through a new war, the Cold War, in the years to follow. Roosevelt's death from bleeding in the brain also ended a deep personal friendship between two world leaders. Winston Churchill later wrote about hearing the news of the death of his close friend. I felt as if I had been struck with a physical blow, Churchill wrote. He said he was overpowered by a sense of deep and permanent loss. The free world joined Churchill in mourning the loss of so strong a leader as Franklin Roosevelt. But it could not weep for long. War was giving way to peace. A new world was forming. And as we will hear in future programs, it was a world that few people expected. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.